evening, the wonderful Akiva Salamani. Hello everyone, um, I'm Akiva. Uh, I was a maths teacher for 40 years, I'm retired now. I taught uh, maths in um, secondary modern schools, comprehensive schools, further education colleges and universities. Now whenever I meet someone new and they ask what my line of work is, and I say I'm a maths teacher, the usual reaction, not always, but the usual reaction is that, uh, oh, maths. Oh no, oh God, I was always hopeless at that. Which makes me very sad, you know, because um, I mean, I do appreciate that uh, a lot of people do have a lot of trouble with maths. They do have a sort of mental block against maths. What does get up my nose a bit sometimes, though, is when someone sort of boasts about being bad at maths. Oh, I was always hopeless at maths. I was always much more on the artistic, creative side. <laughs> which um, I think is a, is a terrible attitude, you know. I'm not saying you should be ashamed of not being good at maths, but it's not something to, to boast of either. <laughs> anyway, um, as I say, uh, I, I have taught adults maths, and a lot of them I find when I'm, I start teaching the slightest bit of maths, this sort of uh, glazed look comes over their eyes and this, this sort of curtain comes down. And I've worked very hard to, to make them relax and to not be afraid and to convince them that they're perfectly intelligent people, you know, and if they haven't got some neurological problem, <laughs> they, they, should, they should be perfectly capable of understanding some simple maths. So anyway, as, um, as you can gather, I love maths and um, I've, I think it's the most aesthetically beautiful subject. And I'm particularly interested in the history and philosophy of maths. And I'm particularly interested in this guy, Euclid. Now, Euclid, um, he was an ancient Greek mathematician. We don't know his exact dates, but uh, we know he flourished around about 300 BC in Alexandria. Now, what's so special about Euclid? Well, he he did this amazing achievement, a monumental achievement. He, he collected together all the maths that was known in his time, which is basically geometry and arithmetic. Not, not algebra, because that was invented hundreds of years later by uh, Arabic civilizations. So he collected together all the maths that was known in his time and proved them all, proved all, all these um, theorems about maths, just starting with, with five basic axioms. Right, he wrote a book called The Elements. Now that contained 13 books which proved 465 propositions in geometry. You know, all the, all the geometry that was taught, meant to be taught in schools about circles and triangles and things. Um, so they're called propositions until he proved it. Once it's proved, it's called a theorem. Now, a theorem is different from a theory. A theory is just, you can constantly sort of um, confirm it, but never prove it finally. Was, with a theorem, once it's proved, it's definitely true and you know, can't be found false. For example, the 47th theorem was Pythagoras' theorem. You probably have sort of some distant memory of this. <laughs> And a lot of people have difficulty with it. I mean, what was it? Well, if you have a right angled triangle, right, with a straight corner, right angle, if you draw a square on each of those sides, basically, Pythagoras theorem says that big square is equal to the other two squares added up together, the areas. So the area of the red square is equal to the area of the green square plus the area of the yellow square. Not that hard, and then people have this fear, oh God, my thanks to theorem, you know, I, I can't possibly learn that. So, so what did he do? He started off with 23 definitions of point, a line, a circle, a triangle, etc. And then he had five common notions, which were sort of obvious truths, 
that are general, not just for geometry. What were these? Right, the first one, things which are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. I don't know if you saw the film uh, Lincoln with uh, Daniel Day-Lewis as Abraham Lincoln. In the film, Lincoln quotes this line, it's his argument for abolition of slavery. What does it mean? Things which are equal to the same thing equal to each other. It means if, if Tim has the same amount of money as Piano and Dan, and I have the same amount of money as Piano and Dan, then Tim and I must have the same amount of money as each other. Two, if equals be added to equals, the holes are equal. Right, so if uh, Tim and I both have ten pounds, and Piano Man Dan gives us each two pounds, the same to each of us, we're still equal, Tim and I are still equal. If equals be subtracted from equals, so if Tim and I got ten pounds, Piano Man Dan takes away two pounds from each of us, we're still equal, Tim and I. Things which coincide with one another are equal to one another. He's going to use this for his, his geometry. Basically, if, say, if one triangle fits exactly onto another triangle, they're the same triangle. And then the fifth one, the whole is greater than the part. Well, this almost goes without saying. You know, a whole cake is bigger than a slice of a cake. So he had those five common notions. Euclid also stated five postulates, or axioms, related specifically to geometry. What is an axiom? An axiom is a truth that is so obviously true, so simple, so self-evident, that it doesn't need to be proved. Because if you're proving things, you've got to start from somewhere, you know, that you don't need to prove. Something that's so obvious that it doesn't need proving. Now, I can't over-exaggerate the importance and the influence of Euclid's work. For thousands of years, people revered Euclid. They held up Euclid as the most perfect way to do a piece of work. To start off with things that are so obvious, and then by logical deduction, prove loads and loads of other things. They thought this was the perfect way to do a piece of work. And across all cultures, People emulated this. I'll give you two examples. The philosopher Baruch Spinoza, he wrote a book called Ethics, but its full title was Ethics Proved in Geometrical Order. Now, this doesn't mean they used geometry in it. What it means is he started off with some basic truths in ethics, what's right and wrong, what's good and bad, and from those basic axioms, he tried to um, argue for everything else that came afterwards in his book. Another example, look at this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You probably would recognise this as from the American Declaration of Independence. What does he say? So they're saying, we hold these truths to be self-evident. They were specifically, deliberately copying Euclid because it was regarded as, as um, the best way to do business. Okay, so, so what were his five axioms? I'm going to show you the first four. Right, to draw a line from any point to any point. What does that mean? Well, if you've got two points, you can join them up with a line. To produce a line continuously. So if you've got a line, you can make it longer, basically. To construct a circle with any centre and radius. So if you're given a specific centre circle and how long the radius is, theoretically you can draw that circle. Number four, that all right angles are equal to one another. Again, this almost is not worth saying, is it? I mean, you know, a right angle is a right angle, though they're obviously the same thing. Right, so I said there were five axioms. I've only shown you the four. Now I'm going to show you the fifth axiom, the one that caused all the trouble. Now don't run out screaming when you, when you see this. Euclid's fifth axiom, that if a line falling on two lines makes the interior angles on the same side together less than two right angles, 
The two lines, if produced indefinitely, meet on that side on which are the angles together less than two right angles. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? What do you think about that? I mean, your reaction is probably the same as mine when I first. I thought, what the fuck is that talking about? <laughs> right? Can't even can't understand what it's saying. So. Let's remind ourselves, what is an axiom? An axiom is a truth. It's so obviously true, so simple, so self-evident, that it doesn't need to be proved. Well, is that, is that simple? Is that self-evident? I don't think so. So, people were, were unhappy. Mathematicians throughout the centuries were very unhappy with this fifth axiom. They said, that's not simple. You know, we, we don't want that as an axiom. So, first of all, they tried they tried to get rid of it as an axiom. They said, well, maybe we don't need it. But they found they couldn't. They, they needed to prove all the other theorems. Then they, um, they thought maybe they could prove it from the other axioms. So if they could prove it, then it doesn't need to be an axiom. Because an axiom doesn't need to be proved. Well, what does it actually mean? It means if you've got two lines, and then you've got a line cutting across it, across those two lines, it will make angles. Right? So basically what Euclid's fifth axiom is saying is those black lines, if you draw them longer, they will meet on the red angle side. They won't meet on the green angle side. So, you know, it's understandable expressed that way. But the, the fifth axiom, people were very, very unhappy with it. <laughs> I mean, it's equivalent, mathematically equivalent to this. Right, so if the red angles and the green angles are actually the same, they're all right angles, then they're not going to meet above the blue line, they're not going to meet below the blue line either. Right? So, mathematicians wanted to get rid of that fifth axiom as an axiom. So they wanted to, they thought if they could prove it, if they could prove that it's true, then they don't need to have it as an axiom. And one method they thought they would try and use in logic, in maths, is called reductio ad absurdum. Reduction to absurdity. So the way, the way this works, if you want to prove something, you assume the opposite, you assume it's not true, show that that leads to a contradiction, and thereby you've proved what you did want to prove. So I want to give you an, a maths example of this, if that's very absurd. Right, using prime numbers. Remember what prime numbers are? Prime number can only be divided by one and itself, exactly. These are the first few prime numbers. Two, three, five, seven, not nine. Nine could be three times three. 11, 13, not 15, that could be 3 times 5. 17, 19, not 21, that could be 3 times 7. 23, not 25, that could be 5 times 5. Not 27, that could be 3 times 9. 29, etc, etc, etc. Now people wondered, do prime numbers go on forever? Because um, when you go into millions and billions and trillions, prime numbers become very rare. You go for millions and millions without finding the next prime number. So people wondered, well, do prime numbers go on forever? Or can you get a prime number that's so big that there isn't one that comes after it? Now, to, to prove by redundant act of certain that prime numbers do go on forever, that there isn't the biggest one. How can we prove this using absurdum. So we want to prove that there isn't a biggest one. So you assume, assume the opposite. You assume that there is a biggest prime number. Call this number P. So P stands for the biggest prime number you get. There isn't another one after it. Now we can theoretically construct a new number. What you'd do is multiply all the prime numbers together up to and including p. So we've got 2 times 3 times 5 da, 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 times up to times p. So this is all the prime numbers 
that exist multiply together. Now add one to this new number. So you've got all the prime numbers multiplied together, plus one. Now look at this new number. Two goes into it, times all the others, remainder one. Three goes into it, times all the others, remainder one. Each of them goes into it, times all the others, remainder one. So nothing goes into it, exactly. So this new number must be a prime number. And it's obviously bigger than P. So we've reached a self-contradiction. We've seen that P is the biggest, P is not the biggest. So thereby we've proved what we want to prove, that you can't have a biggest one. I must do gone forever. So that's a reductio ad absurdum method. And they wanted to use that to prove Euclid's fifth axiom. They wanted to prove that these lines don't meet. Trouble is, if they assume that they do meet, then it doesn't lead to a contradiction. It doesn't lead to a contradiction. Which is very startling. They thought, oh my god, what are we doing with, with Euclid? We can't, we can't mess around with Euclid. So how do they know that it doesn't lead to contradiction? They do it by what's called a mathematical model. They made a model for it. Look at this. Right, if, if two people are standing at the equator, a green person and a blue person, right, and they're walking northwards, they're starting off right angles, the equation, definitely. But they do meet, they will meet at the North Pole. Now, you might think, oh, this is cheating a bit, but all it needs is a tweak of what a, what a line is, it's a section of that great circle. So, this accidentally led mathematicians to realise that Euclid, although it, it, it's, not, it's not proving that Euclid was wrong, Euclid is still perfectly correct given his axioms. But they found that you, you didn't have to have those axioms, you could have a different axiom and it would lead to a different system of geometry. For example, um, air traffic control systems would use this system of geometry, not Euclid's. Same as space travel. Right? So, although Euclid is still sort of revered as being perfect, it freed mathematicians from like the shackles of Euclid. It enabled them to explore new, new ways of thinking, new systems of mathematics, and it led to a a deep understanding of what the foundations of maths was. So anyway, that's it. I hope you found it a little bit interesting. <laughs>